All right, hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is October 14th, 2024. Oh, man, I know, like... Like me, many of you are out there counting down the days. I think some of them can, some people could take it a lot easier. Uh, you know, I, I hear that from comments sometimes, you know, not overly excited about watching for any specific date. I get it. You know, it's, it's happened. It's been happening for what, 2000 years. When Lord, when, when? Well, we know what's been happening here. We've been tracking this for seven years in the revelation of Jesus Christ. The books have opened. We have proven the validity of the open books through the Gospels, through, through the epistles, through from the beginning, from in the beginning of Genesis right to the end of Revelation. It has been a wild, wild, wild seven years of putting this all together. And of course, we will never have it all. We will never understand every part, every piece. But what we have understood has been unequivocally proven in the revelation of all these things. That every time there's a new piece, it fits in the portion it's supposed to fit into. You know, this last one that is coming, Immortal, it was awesome. We've been trying to understand, everybody has, been trying to understand 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 forever. It was literally impossible, in my opinion. To understand its prophetic significance, it was impossible without first understanding the portion of who goes pre, and in particular, the remnant who remain and what happens to them. It would be impossible. It took seven years to figure it out. Seven years. You know, it was sat on the back burner for a long time, taught about it a couple times here and there, and it still wasn't completely jiving. <clears throat> there was a couple parts here and there, just, uh. Not anymore. Not anymore. And it was all because of the revelation. As time progresses, as more revelation came to light, as more pieces connected, it all started to line up. And it just, this is what's been going on here for seven years. And it is so, so exciting. You know, today, I didn't even know what I was going to be teaching on until like two hours ago. I had no idea what I was going to teach on. I pray over it all the time, you know, that the Lord would lead me in his will, in his son, in the word, in his revelation, by the power of his spirit that works in me and all who are his. And I just, I, I didn't know where I was going. And I thought, you know what? The, the last one in the last few, actually, like we said, you know, these last three all fit together. These all fit together. If you haven't watched them, start here, then here then here this one stands all on his own as as a new another piece of scripture revealed in the prophetic is to come and so today because I, there wasn't something new it was you know what based on all of these three and what's come to light and and how we got there and what revealed it and and the and the last minute connections that you know moments before the teaching and then adding it into the teaching because to realize that it was the same connection that we'd been talking about for a year and a half, two years, and it was in there. So I thought what we should do is at least in part, build it into whatever I'm going to teach on. Something that would align this teaching to, to help people really understand the parts and the components that led to why we're looking at the time we're looking at. Not only because it's <laughs> the very tail end of 70 years, but because of all of the components around it that we had already understood, that we were already looking for, but had a little something here that like, why a year's end and another year's end? Why, you know, how do we get to the Lord's, you know, two months after his birth, after his birthday? How, how did all this play out and how does that equal now when I thought it equaled August? You know, so we touched on these things, we talked on them, but now I'm going to kind of put it all together in this one section. But I thought, you know, how do I do that? I don't want to just do a teaching and just, you know, here's the date again, here's this, and here's how we got there. You know, we, we've already understood what it is. We already know what we're looking to. So I wanted to build a teaching around it or within it to, to show the the awesomeness 
of of the revelation as a whole something that will cover the the open books something that will cover the the revelation of the understanding of the timing something that will that will connect to to the years and the revelation of the years something that would connect pre mid post to be seen in the revelation of it all all of that into one teaching and I, my my finger ends up hitting my phone i was as i was looking through uh, my e sword and i was going to something and then i end up in john and i went from john and i thought this and and that's how it started <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't any miraculous thing I just I do my best to just allow the spirit to lead and it's not because I'm hearing anything it's not because I'm feeling anything it's not because I'm getting any visions of it or audibles or anything like that I just let the spirit lead just go in and I start reading or what happens many times as you guys know which we will briefly talk on like with Articus with Arcticus um, you know people send me information people say have you checked this have you looked here? Uh, look at this Bible study that I'm doing. And people have shared things many, many times over the years. It happens every single day. I can't obviously get to all of them. None of us can get to all of them. But we go, uh, I'll go in and I'll look into these things. And that's how so many of, hey, what about this? And hey, what about that? In fact, that's what caused the last teaching even. The revelation, the, the understanding having been revealed in First Thessalonians 4 was because of a couple sisters that had asked about, what about this in First Thessalonians within studies that they were doing on their own? We are a like-minded group of brothers and sisters from all across the earth who are diligently seeking and searching the Lord in his word to draw closer and to better understand him in his love letters, in his letters that he's left us to get to understand him better. That's what we're doing. And one of the places we do that, if you're new, is you can go to ministryrevealed.com, click on it right here, go to the menu, click on forum. It'll take you a few seconds to sign up. And there's close to 1,300 people from all over the world in there sharing Bible studies they're doing, the events, the news, things going on in Israel and around the world, <coughs> excuse me, prayer requests, um, all sorts of things but like-minded brothers and sisters from all over the world. So if you would like to join us, it's free. It'll take a few seconds to sign up. You can go to ministryrevealed.com and join us in there. Um, so now that you have uh, an idea of where it's going, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cover quite a bit. We're going to be like right here going right across, <coughs> which, excuse me, which isn't anything new, of course. But I just... It, it was just exciting. You know, it's exciting to be able to go from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation and, and to be able to understand. To be able to understand these things, it is, it's absolutely mind-blowing. So it's not that there's going to be so much new information, though for many it might be new because maybe they didn't catch this piece before or they never caught that before or, you know, whatever the case may be. So I'm, I'm positive you're going to get some new stuff out of this. But this is going to cover a gamut, like just a whole variety of things within the total of the revelation. And I, it, it's a great reminder is another thing. It's a great reminder of what we've understood, what we've been given without going into all the details of, of the Gospels and the discourses and the book of Revelation and in the beginning and, and all of these things without going into every single detail and being here for hours on end. It's it's a great way to just say, man, this is crazy. I still shake my head, and I know you hear me say it often. I shake my head every day. I still can't believe how blessed we have been. I do not understand why we have been chosen for this. But the evidence, not because I say it, the evidence is the revelation in all of these teachings over the last seven years. That's the revelation, guys. That is, that's the evidence that it's all true. We've understood it, guys. And today, we're going to run through a bunch of it to see how clearly and how much of it in a big picture down to the day that we have understood it. And if you're new to the ministry, <clears throat> excuse me, as I always do, I always suggest you come to this playlist link right here on YouTube. And watch this intro series right here. This intro series, you don't have to watch. There's 12 videos, 
but watch the first four videos these first four teachings if you have ever if you're newer or if you're new and you have ever had questions within the gospels and wondered why stories sounded the same but were clearly different time frames or different events taking place within what should be the same within the three gospels the synoptic gospels if you've ever wondered why and you've been told it's just it's perspective well what you haven't understood is that there's a was is and is to come was is from creation to christ is is from christ until the moment of the pre-trib and is to come is from the pre-trib until the end everything plays out in threes you're going to see a lot of that here tonight pre mid post spirit son father luke mark matthew over and over and over and over again you're going to see that it's seven 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 right there's an easy seven which are the final seven of the spirit preparing the gentile bride seven years of seals seven years of trumpets you're saying wait a second seven of seals seven of trumpets that's 14 years of tribulation yeah you got it but first you have to understand who the gospels are speaking to don't just dismiss this i promise you if you've ever looked to try to understand things that have that have caused you a headache or made you scratch your head trying to understand them you're you've come to the right place the spirit has led you here and this first 22 minute video is a 22 minute intro that will give you a little overlay of what you're about to understand in the next three the second one is a 30 minute bible study of what i was talking about of the differences of who the gospels are speaking to and the one of the key examples i like to use is if you go into luke's gospel you're going to see jesus before going to the cross was arrayed in a gorgeous robe which means white radiant and beautiful if you go to mark he was arrayed in purple and if you go to matthew he was arrayed in scarlet i always like to say these guys weren't colorblind so what gives it's prophecy yes one robe was taken off something else was put on and so on and so forth that's what took place in the is but what's the prophetic understanding of it what why why is it given to us why does this one say gorgeous which means white radiant beautiful like a bride why does the other one say purple and the other one say scarlet well a gorgeous white robe is is bride talk right that's luke's group mark's group is purple matthew's group is scarlet the woman riding the beast in revelation is arrayed in purple and scarlet ah interesting right these are the types of things you'll begin to understand just in this 30 minute intro and then we've got teachings as you go further that go way deeper um we've got some that go like three hours three hour teachings in the differences in the gospels and we do it all throughout the teachings regularly as well the third one is a 30 minute bible study on the revelation of the years themselves it is a period of time called 14 years and to most people that's when they turn us off that's when they say oh this guy doesn't know what he's talking about for 200 years we've been told it's seven years well i'm afraid to tell you that there's a period called 14 years and a portion called above which refers to four, uh, 50 days and the reason it has never been understood is because everybody in the third video the big video two hours and 43 minutes it's because everybody has been taught from the gospel of matthew their foundation is in the gospel of matthew and they only look to mark and to luke a little bit to try to fill in the details of what's being talked about in matthew and that has caused the entire world of the church to see everything only as seven years and the seven years of judah of jacob's trouble they have missed what mark's portions for and they have missed what luke's portions for luke's is the pre-trib and then 50 days Mark's is the seven years of seals and in the seventh is the great multitude mid-trib rapture and in Matthew is to the house of Judah to the Jews and then the return of the Lord feet down on the Mount of Olives post-trib in the seventh year which is the seventh year of trumpets which is the 14th year of tribulation it is going to blow your mind this is how crazy just this is in the intro you know even when I speak of it now and I'm saying it I'm thinking about the the wildness of it the the amazement in all of that revelation because just in this alone these two right here the gospels and the years is what opens up all of the scriptures you will understand things that have caused you confusion 
for years will start to make sense. It's, it's happened to thousands of us around the world, tens of thousands. I promise you it'll be worth your time. All right? So with that, brothers and sisters, let's start going down this trail here today. Oh, this is freezing. Hopefully not too long. Uh-oh. Come on. There we go. All right. So, we understand what June 21st, 2024 was. We know that, and um, this isn't really what we're getting into right away, but it's going to build all around this and, you know, from the beginning to the end and so forth. Okay, we know that what happened this year, we know and we're going to get into what this what this means, what how this came about and the importance of it. And we're going to see the revelation of it even in the in the understanding from Arcturus. And what happens is, as you've heard me say in recent teachings, is that only this year, this year for the next 30 years is the only time where the summer solstice of June 21st lands at the full moon. So you have the time of the of the sun, you have uh, at the summer solstice, and you have the full moon. And you have it in the month of the constellation of Taurus, which was as it was in the beginning. There was a reason that it happened this year. And the biggest thing is because in the Hebrew calendar, they added a second Adar or a 13th month from last year, which ended up pushing it out even further than it would have normally been. And this only happens to exactly this date, this year, and not again for another 30. And I've been talking about this over the last couple of few, well, actually, probably over the last few months, how, how wild this is that it lands right here in what we believe we've been able to show and prove the last option for the 70th year of Israel. This was this was monumental. This was a massive, massive key to be able to see that it was in Taurus with the sun, with the full moon, as it was in the beginning of creation. So we're going to touch on some of that, but really the focus of this is 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 a, is a genesis to the, uh, the gospel of... Uh, sorry. The Gospel of John to the book of Genesis in the first 21 chapters as John's 21 chapters and tie in how this all takes part of it to where we're looking to here in the mid-later portion of October 2024. We already know it's because this is the final option for the 70th year of when Israel came into the land in 1948. It is a biblical count given to us from the book of Leviticus chapter 19, I think 23 through 25. When they came into the land, they also had to plant trees. That was from 1948. They didn't plant until February of 1949. They're not the house of Israel, so they don't count in the spring. They're the house of Judah. It is the Jews who are in the land, the house of Judah. It is not replacement theology. They are the house of Judah, the world of Christianity. They are the house of Israel. Okay? The Luke group is the pre-trib of everybody in Christ, Jew and Gentile alike. The mid-trib is the end of the Gentile age. That is the world, the, the house of Israel, the Gentiles grafted in. That is the house of Israel. But then there's the house of Judah, and the house of Judah are the Jews. Okay, there, It's not some replacement theology. There's the house of Israel, and there's the house of Judah. And in the end, they will all be one again. It'll be one group all together fully again. But the world, so that's where you get Luke, the pre-trib bride, all of them in Christ. The second group is the, is the Mark group, and it's the world, those who come to Christ in, in, in the house of Israel with the Gentiles grafted in because they're all scattered throughout the world. Nobody knows who the house of Israel is. That's because they're the church. And then you've got the house of Judah which is to the end of trumpets and their promise of peace on earth, right? Their millennial reign and so forth. So that's also important to remember. So let's get started in this. Look 
and how it starts in John chapter 1. You know, John chapter, we love this, right? When this revelation first came about, oh man, four-ish or so years ago? No, probably more like five now. Wow. That when, when this revelation came about and saw how it connected to Genesis, it was another one of those really exciting, exciting moments. Because the, the 21 chapters of John were the equivalent of going in to the same 21 chapters of Genesis. They were giving us neck and necks, chapter to chapter to chapter, as if they were the 21 years being played out of the end of days in typology. And they were connecting to the revelations that we knew would play out in the end of days. And so when John chapter 1 to Genesis came about, oh my goodness, it was awesome. Right? You guys remember this? In the beginning was the word. Okay, that's what do we know the beginning is? The beginning is the word. Jesus is the word. Jesus is the beginning. Okay? And the word was with God. And the word was God. Jesus is God, but he was given everything by the Father to go and create. Okay? Jesus is the word, and every word he spoke was from the Father. You see? So the word was God because Jesus is God. And the word, uh, uh, sorry, was with God. And the word was God. You see this even if you go into uh, Hebrews chapter 1. Jesus is being called God by the Father who is God, <laughs> right? Because it's God the Father and God the Son. This right here, in the beginning was the Word. Jesus was the Word. He was the beginning. He is the beginning. We know that he's called the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. Wait, the Alpha, right? Because Alpha represents what? Taurus, the ox, the beginning. He is the beginning and the end. And then what do we see? We see the same as with God. We see in verse 4 of John chapter 1. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Uh, this is in relation, uh, da -da -da -da, keep going. Verse 5. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. This right here, guys, is it's essentially the context of, of everything we talk about. Maybe maybe that's a little bit too much to say of everything we talk about. But in relation to a group of people being prepared in the Lord, who are part of those who are in the beginning, the sons of God, who have the Spirit of God in them, there's a group which I believe we're a part of, a group being prepared through the revelation, who are waiting for the Son of who was made light to come and shine his light in the darkness. That's the timing of the 40 days of the Son of Man coming after the pre-trib and the seven-day wedding. We've understood this. We understand it. We know it. And we see it absolutely everywhere. We see it here in John 1. Oh, we see it in John 8 as well. We see it in Isaiah 9. We see it connected to Matthew 4, connected to Isaiah 9. We see it in Genesis chapter 1. Everywhere. Why? Because this was the beginning. And in the beginning was the first creation, which was the spirit. And in that spirit creation, the world has called it gap theory and they don't know if it means that's how they can explain billions of years or whether it's whatever amount of time. But it's a mysterious piece, portion of time to them. I believe it equals in our years would be 7,000 years. To the Lord would be as seven days. But we're only given two verses in Genesis chapter 1 about the beginning. And then what do we see? Then we see... The light that shines in the darkness. Jesus was made light and he shines in the darkness. The darkness comprehended it not. And we see here in John, as we keep going, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. Okay? Who was the light? Jesus was the light. So it means Jesus had to be made light after he was spirit, right? Well, that's what we know from Genesis. And we see, because uh, John was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Uh, that was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Spirit in the beginning first, 
then light that shines in the darkness for the second portion. And when we come down here, look at what we get. Verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Do you know what's going to happen at the end when the Lord returns feet down? That's the final portion when the flesh portion is over for Judah and the Lord returns feet down and what happens? He's now going to dwell among them for the millennial reign. Spirit like flesh. But was Jesus, look at this, so Jesus was made flesh, right? If you follow it from Genesis, you have the beginning. You have him being made light and shining in the darkness. And then you have when flesh is made. But Jesus wasn't the flesh in the beginning. Well, of course not, right? We know that. Let's go to Genesis 1. Let's see the same context. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So in Jesus, God the Father created heaven and earth, right? Jesus created it all. The Father gave it to him to go and create. And he was so excited. All of this was that first creation, that spirit portion. And it says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. This is that gap theory I was talking about earlier, if you haven't heard me talk about that before. This they can't explain fully. We can't either, but we know that that first portion of creation related to a first 7,000 years, which to the Lord would have been of seven days, which if we were there in time would have been a 7,000. Because the revelation of all of creation is 777. 7,000, 7,000, 7,000. In the end of days, seven easy, seven years of easy, right? Preparing the easy years, seven years of seals, and then seven years of trumpets. And when it's all over, it's the final jubilee, the, 20, the 22nd year, which would be the jubilee. And, or we say the 15th, when it's the 14 years, seals and trumpets. And in the big picture, it would be, the, 21, the end of 21,000 years after the millennial reign, and it would be the new beginning. It is all about 7771, just like the menorah. 7771. That is the revelation, 22. And so we see here in the beginning that it's connected to the Spirit of God. So you have Jesus, you've got the Father, and you've got the Spirit. Remember, Jesus is the beginning. He is called the Aleph. Right? That's Taurus, the ox. And he's called the cross, the end. Oh, wait a second. How many letters is that? 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Funny how that works, right? Look what happens in verse 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. You know, until the, we, we had the revelation here and that this verse came to light <laughs> when I taught on it, and it was such a mind blower for me because I had never, ever caught all of this until I did the teaching on it. Because it had never dawned on me that this creation of light, I'd never heard it taught before, that this light was Jesus. I'm sure many people understood it, but I had never, ever heard it taught in all my years. This light in verse 3 of Genesis 1 is Jesus. You know it because John confirms it. There was the beginning, and then there was the light. Who was that light? Not John. John was the one to bear witness of that light. Who was that light? Jesus. Hello. Jesus was that light. And John bore witness of that light, and that light came to shine his light in the darkness. Well, look at what it says. God said, let there be light. This is God the Father and Jesus then becoming light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Huh. And the uh, uh, and God called the light day and the darkness he called night. Dividing the light from the darkness. Funny how that works, right? The second portion, light from darkness. So you have the first portion which relates to the Holy Ghost, which relates to the spirit. The spirit of God. You got the second one that relates to light. And when that light comes, it's going to separate the light from the darkness. The darkness won't comprehend it. And what did we get out of all this? You guys remember all of this, right? We're going to keep going. We're, we'll get back to it in a second. And then what do we see? Then we have that was the first day, second, third, fourth, fifth, right? It goes all the way through. And look at what we see. <clears throat> Something we spoke about earlier. Here we are in the beginning. Aleph, 
Taurus. And what do we see? By verse 16, it said, And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And he made the stars also. Well, this date right here, in 2024, won't happen again for the next 30 years, is the date that is in Taurus, in the month of Savan on the Hebrew calendar, is when the sun is in Taurus. And this is, of course, the summer solstice in Taurus at the full moon. So the sun is at its brilliance. You've got the full moon that is shining its light, and it's doing it as it was in the beginning in Taurus. So that's some, that's some significant stuff going on there. And then what do we see? We see one, two, three, four, five, six days. And then we go to chapter two of Genesis. And we see the seventh day when he rested. After the seventh day, what do we see? He then forms man from the dust of the ground. This is the next set of seven. Everybody has been confused and has taught that this creation of, of Adam and Eve are the same creations. Now, some people have caught it. Some people have noticed that there's a difference of creation, but you certainly won't get it from the church. And we can show what this difference is. It's not, this isn't recounting the story of Adam and Eve, and, uh, in, in particular Adam, when he was breathed and when he was made flesh. Because in Genesis chapter 1, being made in our image and in our likeness isn't flesh. Because remember what verse 3 said, Jesus was made light. We saw in John, he was the light. So Jesus was made light, which means this creation of males and females in their likeness were light beings. They were light beings. What that looks like, some sort of bodies, but they were light. I don't know what it looks like, but they were not yet flesh. These, this group wasn't flesh. And what do we know from this? We know just as when you continue on from the first creation spirit, the second creation of the days was light. We now come into the third portion of creation, which is flesh, spirit, light, flesh. When Jesus came, did Jesus come to be the spirit of the world? No, he came to be the light of the world. And then the spirit was given later, right? And then you got those who are living in this portion of the flesh. What is the flesh? Adam and Eve, right? Adam was made flesh. So is this a representation of Jesus? No, not exactly, but watch. In John chapter 1, he was the beginning, which is Aleph, right? He was the beginning. He was spirit. Then it was light. And then Jesus was made flesh, right? When he came 2,000 years ago. But he wasn't Adam. You see, I want to make that clear. I'm not saying that if he was spirit first and then he was light as in Genesis 1 and then after that we come to the flesh and we see that Adam is formed. Is Jesus Adam? No. Jesus came to correct the mistakes of Adam. You see? And we get this from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, uh, chapter 15. Right? We see this uh, in verse 45. And so it is written. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Verse 47. The first man is of the earth earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. So, of course, we know that Jesus, when he came in the flesh, is, of course, the Lord from heaven. And what did he come? What was he coming as? The last Adam. The first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam <coughs> was made was spiritual and from heaven. But he's a type of Adam. Of course he is. If he was the beginning and then he was light and then there was flesh, but he wasn't that flesh. Why did he come as why did he come as flesh? He came as flesh to to correct the sins of Adam. And when he came to correct the sins in the flesh, what did he come as? came as light he came as light for what 
to save his portion of people that were created in his image, which were the light group, which represents Mark's portion, which represents this group remaining during seals. It is so wild to comprehend these things, to, to track them, to follow them, to see how it all plays out. And that's why the pre-trib goes first. Because when the pre-trib group goes, they're the portion of the Spirit. Then a portion from them will remain, and the Lord comes for 40 days, and he's coming to shed his light in the darkness again. Again! To shed his light in the darkness. A third time. At the beginning of creation, at his coming, and at the third time. Everything is in threes. Just like pre-mid-post. It is so absolutely incredible. Now, for those who haven't seen this portion before, you can now see how Jesus isn't, of course, Adam, but he came to bring that correction. He was from heaven spiritual, right? And he came to correct and, and take upon the sins because of the sins, because it's what? In the flesh, right? We, the spirit wars against the flesh. And then what happens? Well, in Genesis chapter 1, we saw in the time of light, when Jesus was made light, and we see that it's one, two, three, four, five, six, and then the seventh day he rested. Well, what do we do? How do we account for that? What does that mean? Again, another incredible revelation that we revealed a few years ago. In 2 Peter 3, 8, it says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day, okay? Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, forward you have day one day two day three okay one day so there were seven days each one of those days is with the lord as a thousand years so if each of those days in genesis one to the beginning of two was one day which means with us they would be as one thousand years <clears throat> which means if we were there in the time in, in the dimension of time each one of those days in creation would have been as 1,000 years, which means if we were in the dimension of time when that light creation and all that was being created and those light beings created in his image, if we were there observing it in the dimension of time, each one of those days was 1,000 years. But to the Lord, each of them was as one day. And then what happens? Well, then we ended up the next creation of beings was the flesh. The flesh began the next and final 7,000. So you have seven days of creation, which if we were there in time would have been a 7,000 years. And then we have the next 7,000. And from Adam, what are we counting from Adam? From Adam, we're living in what? The thousand years. We're living in the 6,000 years, and when the 6,000 years are over, which is at the end of the tribulation, by the way, when the 14 years are over, and it's the Jubilee, that begins the millennial reign. That would have been what? 6,000 years, and the 7,000th is the rest. And look at what it says. Comma, and. That means a division and in addition to. That means he wasn't just saying here, oh, you can reverse it and just read it one way or the other. It equals the same. No, it's there's a each day is as a thousand years, comma, and each thousand years is to the Lord as a day. And those who have been around for a while, I know you know this already very well. But it ties into everything we're talking about here. It's it's one of those mind blowing moments that we had as well. Because the days of creation would have been to us if we were there as a thousand year each. And from Adam, from the flesh, which we saw from John, which we saw from Genesis, from the flesh, we've now been in the thousands of years. But to the Lord God, they're still only as one day each, which means the days of creation were seven days to the Lord and the thousands of years, the 6,000, then the thousand year millennial reign, each one of those is to the Lord as one day, as, as six days, and then the seventh day. So you had Genesis 1 days, six days, and then the seventh day rest. And then we're in the thousands right now, which to the Lord 
are a thousand days each, six days, and then the millennial reign is the seventh day rest of the Lord. But to us, we're living in 6,000 years, and then it's the seventh day millennial reign as the 7,000th year. And if we were back in the days of creation, each of those days would have been as thousands. So you have to the Lord seven days and seven days. If man was back there back then in time, it would have been 7,000 years, and we're living in what? 7,000 years. 14 days, 14,000 years, and the end of days is what? 14 years. Funny how that works, right? Funny how that happens, isn't it? And remember the first, second Corinthians, you know, the I told you in the beginning, if you're new, that it's 14 years and a portion called the above that relates to Luke's portion. That's that beginning creation. That's that gap theory of Genesis 1 and 2. The spirit portion. Those of the sons of God. Just like it said. The first portion is the portion with the son, the father, who is the Lord, who is the beginning. And it's what? And the spirit of God moved over the face of the waters. The son, the father, the spirit. This portion is the portion of the spirits. It was the portion of spirit. It was all the creation of spirit. The second one was light. The third one was flesh. So if the, if the, the third one was flesh, <clears throat> and it relates to Matthew's portion, to the house of Judah and their promise of the millennial reign, and then we have the second portion, which was light, and it relates to Mark's group, the portion of seals, to the world that he came to shed his light on because when Jesus came, he didn't come for those who were already in Christ or, you know, uh, um, in their Messiah and ready for him and everything else. He came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He came but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And who do they represent? The world. Those who had gotten lost. He came and when he will come again, this representation of seals, when he comes for 40 days, and he's here for 40 days and he gives the power and authority to a group of workers from the spirit. They will go out as Christ to go and shed his light upon waking up this great multitude that will come in in the great multitude mid-trib rapture, which was his portion of those that he created in the light portion. It's isn't it crazy to track and to understand these things. So. <clears throat> here's this first portion, which is spirit. We talk about this one a lot in Romans chapter 8. You want to understand who a Christian is, read the book of Romans. And what I mean by Christians, I mean those in Christ, spirit-filled. And in this portion, it talks a lot specifically about, yes, everybody that is going pre-trip who is in Christ, spirit-filled. But it also talks a lot about a, a portion who's going to remain to serve him. But we see it right here. Romans 8, uh, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Okay? Spirit, not flesh. Spirit, not flesh. Spirit, not flesh. All over the place. Until we come down to famous verses. Verse 14 for as many as are led by the Spirit of God. Remember Genesis 1, verse 2? Those by the Spirit of God, they are what? They are the sons of God. This group right here are what our brother Mark likes to say, the one oneers. That first creation, Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2. This is that first group. This represents everybody going pre-trib who is in Christ's Spirit-filled. And then there's a portion reserved, held back from among them who are going to serve the Lord, be with them for 40 days, have revelation, greater detail, understanding, be anointed by the Holy Ghost, and they will go out and serve during seals as Christ did to what? Shed his light on the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Until the times of the Gentiles are over which is Mark's portion at the end of seals, the great multitude rapture. These are the heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. 
This is that group of workers, as we shared in the last one, who will suffer with him to take portion, to take part, I should say, in his glory. They will be glorified together. They will take part in the resurrection of the just and rule and reign with him for the millennial reign. And look what it says next. Verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. Isn't that crazy? For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. You see what's going on here? The creature creation. This is the mark portion. This is the portion of light that ended up getting corrupted. The church that got corrupted in, in this time that we're in. And their last portion to come to the Lord is to the end of seals. Look at what it says. They're waiting for the sons of God. The sons of God, this revelation of the sons of God will happen at the time of the pre-trip. And then it goes on to be the time of the creature. This was the creature in the creation of days. The beings that were created. They, they were made subject to vanity. Let me show you this for those who hadn't seen this before. In Genesis chapter 1, in relation to the creature, we see, <clears throat> we see, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. This image, and they were subject to what? Vanity. They were created, and they, they're the, the, the portion in creation called the creature. And they were, they were made subject to vanity. Not because it, they, they knowingly fell away in the creation back in Genesis. But because of this, of this corruption that took place from the fall with Lucifer and everything else. Sorry, give me one second. A cat made his way into my garage. I just hear meowing. <laughs> oh, he was gone when I went out to look for him. He must have just ran back out under the garage, under the garage door. All right. So we could see this, this incredible connection with this first portion of spirit, this second portion of light, and this third portion being of flesh. We see how Christ is represented in all three of them, and there is also the spirit, and there is the son, which is his portion, and then the father's portion, which is the flesh people the, for Judah, if you will. Okay, So we've seen all of these, and all of this relates again to what? This differences, these differences within the Gospels. To be able to, to understand that the synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the end, are Luke, Mark, Matthew. The first will be last, the last will be first. It's going to go, it's going to revert back to as it was in creation. And what was it in creation? In creation, it started with spirit first, then light, then flesh. And then when the Gospels came about, we had Matthew, Mark, and then Luke in the Synoptic Gospels. Well, that's, that's flesh, then light, then spirit. And then we read in the Gospels that the first will be last, the last will be first. And we understand from the revelation of all this that Luke is the spirit, Mark is the light, and Matthew is the flesh. It's the same, it's, it's the same story being repeated within the Gospels, and that's the power of understanding the, the reasoning and the purpose to these differences within the Gospels. Because it is the revelation of the Gospels that revealed and opened all of this to us in the leading of the Spirit. The Spirit of God working in the sons and daughters of God. This is what's going on. This is why it is so incredibly powerful. Like To talk about this from John into Genesis 1, from John 1, and to be able to track it, you could see there's three different creations. I mean, there's spirit, light, flesh. You don't have to be a genius. But it's so confusing. It is absolutely impossible to wrap your mind around it when everything in your foundation of understanding in the Gospels is the Gospel of Matthew. It becomes impossible to comprehend fully. And those who have seen it in parts and pieces and know there's something else there still get confused and try to take Genesis 2, the flesh portion, and, and try to cover the light portion in it and say that that's them because they have to because they only see seven years. So if you only see seven years of tribulation because you're Matthew 24 all the time, then guess what else I'll bet you you only see? 7,000 years since creation. Hello. 
It'll only be 7,000 years to the end of the millennial reign since the flesh. But there was another seven, which was the light. And there was another seven, which was the spirit. But that spirit portion, which was another seven, we're only being given a glimpse of. And that glimpse, glimpse is the pre-trib bride being taken, a remnant in the spirit remaining until the Lord comes to shine his light in the darkness, which is the beginning of his 40 days as the white horse rider. Wild awesomeness to understand. And you see, we see all these three groups right here. When you have the prophetic understanding, when your eyes have been opened, when your spirit has received it, you will understand as you read through scriptures everywhere, because you understand these differences in the Gospels, you will see Luke, Mark, Matthew. You will see their, the, the discourses, Luke, Mark, Matthew, in order being played out. And you will understand the prophetic layer in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. When Paul says, I knew a man in Christ. Just like Romans, those who are in Christ spirit filled above 14 years ago. It's such an one, which means like one caught up. This is the word harpazo. Okay, it's the Greek word or the, 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 yeah, the Greek word for what the English we say rapture. And where do they go? They go to the third heaven. <clears throat> and then it says, and I knew such a man. So remember now, now the Mark portion, the Mark portion weren't in Christ's spirit filled or they would have been gone in the pre-trib. They're here to remain. They weren't ready. They, they believed in the Lord, but that was about it. They weren't fully committed to him. They weren't devoted to him. They weren't diligently seeking and searching him. And what do they get called? Paul in the typology is now such a man. So if this is Paul in all of this, then Paul is in Christ and all of a sudden he's not really in Christ. You see, it's, it's the purpose of these little word changes that are all throughout Scripture. He's representing here a picture of the pre-trib group, the Mark portion in the seventh year of seals, who will be the was caught up. But they don't go to the third heaven. <coughs> Excuse me, they go to paradise. There's your pre, there's your mid, and then look at what he says down here. Verse 14, behold, the third time... I am ready to come to you. He's talking about Judah. A taking, a taking, and a return. Wild how that works, right? We've showed this in, uh, in these here, you, you guys that have been around for a while. This is from the Apocrypha, and it's called from uh, Fragments 5. It says, as the elders say, then those who are deemed worthy of an abode in heaven will go there. Others will enjoy the delights of paradise, and others will will possess the splendor of the city. For everywhere, the Savior will be seen. He'll be seen in all three of them accordingly. Okay? According as they will be worthy to see him. But that there is this distinction between the habitation of those who produce a hundredfold and those that produce 60 and those that produce 30. For the first will be taken into the heavens. The second class will dwell in paradise and the last will inhabit the city. Pre, mid, post. Even given to us in the Apocrypha. Spirit, light, flesh. There's a reason I'm building on all of these things, even though you've understood this before. is because once the spirit portion is over and the pre-trib is taken, it goes back to what? Then it, it turns to this portion we were talking about. Then it's light. Then there's going to be a time when, once the spirit portion is done. The pre-trib, those who are in Christ, Jew and Gentile alike, gone. Then what do you have? Well, then it's got to be light. Because if you follow the creation story, the very next verse, verse 3, Jesus was made light and he comes to shine his light in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. Which means, as soon as the pre-trib comes, the next thing we should be tracking is the Lord coming as light. Wild, right? So what else do we see with this pre, mid, and post? Watch this. You guys will, you guys will see and remember all of these things. Here's the pre-trib. 
in Luke chapter 21. This is the pre-trib right here. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. This is the spirit-filled, in Christ, accounted worthy pre-trib group that are going to be at the Gentile wedding of the Lord pre-trib in the above 14 years portion. When we read about the coming of the Son of Man in Luke's discourse, uh, in verse 20, 27 and 28, this is not about his coming for the pre-trib group. This is about his coming for his 40 days after the pre-trib group has been taken and the wedding takes place. You guys will remember this. We shared this in a recent video, and we'll end up touching about on it again. But look at what you see. The pre-trip, right here, verse 36. The very next verse after the pre-trip is, And in the daytime he was teaching in the temple, and at night he went out and abode in the mount that is called the Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to him in the temple for to hear him. This is wildly important in connection with this stuff that we're going to be talking about as it builds to this season and time that we're in right now. So what about Mark? Well, you go to Mark's discourse, and it just so happens that you see the Son of Man coming again. And when you see him coming in Luke, which is when he returns for his 40 days after the wedding, he's coming as the white horse rider. We see that it says he's coming in, but it means on, and it's the word singular cloud. In Mark's discourse, the Lord's coming, which is the end of the sixth year of seals, he's coming in, and it means in, uh, sorry, in, in, not on. In Luke's, it means in, but it's singular word cloud. In Mark's, it's the word in, and it's the plural word of clouds. But as we've shown, this isn't when the rapture takes place. This is simply the Lord coming at the end of the sixth year of seals as you see him in Revelation chapter 6. This is when he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion. He's coming with a mountain carved without hand, like Daniel says, that will crush the, the beast, right? That will crush him, that will destroy all the enemies. And that's just the end of the sixth year of seals. But the great multitude rapture doesn't happen right away. It happens about midway through that seventh year of seals. But this is a picture of him coming at the end of the six year of seals. What about Matthew 24? In Matthew 24, we can show another type. We see the pre, we see the mid, <coughs> excuse me, and we see the post. Here we see in Matthew 24, verse 30, the Son of Man's coming. But this word in isn't the word in if you go into any of your Strong's concordances, like we use here on Esword. You'll see this in the teaching of the intro series, if you're new as well. You'll see this in the intro teaching, that the word in, only in Matthew, isn't the word in. For some reason, they use the word in, but it means on. This is when he's returning feet down on the Mount of Olives, when he's coming on the clouds. But when he's coming on the clouds, this is his return post-trib. And when he returns post-trib, like we saw, you see? You see how it all lines up? Pre, mid, post, the third time he's coming to them? You see? This is what's going on. But these are about his comings that aren't directly associated to when he's gathering people. In the discourses, it's his comings. In Luke's, it's a week after, the eighth day after he's taken the pre-trib and he's had the wedding. In Mark, it's at the end of the sixth year of seals. But the great multitude rapture going to paradise is going in the midst of the seventh year of seals. And when the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives, he still has one more year to go because now he's got to defeat Satan and all the armies and the treading of the grapes. And that's why you have, it'll be as the days of Noah, which relate not to the story of the 40 days of the Son of Man, but to the whole story of Noah which was one year and 10 days long. That's the story. 
<coughs> he's coming at the end of 13 years, the end of the sixth year of trumpets, feet down on the Mount of Olives, which is the start of the 14th year, or the start of the seventh year of trumpets. He's feet down, and he will be here for that final year, destroying all the enemies, all of his enemies, and all who came against Jerusalem. And then, when that final 14th year, that year and 10 days is over, as the days of Noah, then you see Matthew chapter 25 when he's coming then for the Jewish wedding. It starts with a Gentile wedding and it ends with the Jewish wedding. <clears throat> and when he comes, the shofar, as we know, is going to be blasted at the end of that 14th year, at the end of that final year of Noah's, as Noah's. And when he sounds it, it's going to be the sound of the Jubilee. Now, all the house of Judah and those that were taken in the wilderness will be brought back from mid trumpets that were gone for the last three and a half years. Remember, they will be brought back for the Jubilee. It'll be divisions of land and everything else in the beginning of the millennial reign. <clears throat> Where else do we see this? A pre mid post this this same context of what's taking place. We see it in Revelation chapter five. We see right here. Uh, in verse 9, for thou was slain and has redeemed us unto God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Uh, verse 11, and I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. This is your pre trip. And then what do you get? Revelation 7. Revelation 7 is after the sixth year of seals and before the seventh seal begins. But it's after the six years of seals, after the sixth seal. And what do we have? A great multitude that no man can number. Some that were the dead and those that were alive. So those that died during seals, having given their life to Christ, and those who made it through to the end are now what? Well, they're now in paradise. The great multitude is now taken to paradise. See how that works? The first group in heaven, the second group is in paradise. And then what do we see? Then we go to Revelation 11. In Revelation 11, at the seventh angel, when in Revelation 10, it tells you as soon as the seventh angel begins to sound, which is the, the, the third woe, the final woe, as soon as it begins to sound, the mystery of God is over because the Lord it will be seen coming on the clouds like Matthew, feet down on the Mount of Olives. And then you see, see, in his wrath and the time of the dead and all of that, everybody's freaking out that, you see, and the nations were angry and thy wrath has come. You see, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, thou shalt give us them reward to the servants. You see, because there's going to be that portion resurrected, the first workers, right? So here we see him returning, feet down. And now here you would say, you could see him returning. Everything in heaven and on earth is now his, but... What's the evidence? How do you know it's his return feet down? Well, to prove it out, we just go to Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14, we see it right here. Verse 4, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. This is when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. And it just so happens it's the last chapter, beginning of the last chapter of Zechariah 14. Spirit, light, flesh. Right? Holy Ghost, Son. Father, pre, mid, post, Luke, Mark, Matthew. It plays over and over and over again. So now remember, as we go back and we're trying to track in this period of time that we're looking for, we know if the beginning was Taurus and in the time of the beginning, the light the two great lights in the beginning, in Taurus, in Aleph, that the two great lights <clears throat> were light to rule the day and light to rule the night. I have come to believe, though I'm not absolutely convinced, I have come to believe that what it shows us is that the first day of the first month in Taurus as it was in the beginning, is revealed to us this year as June 21st. In the Hebrew calendar, the 15th 
day of the third month, which is Savan. Now, of this, I am as convinced as can be. But what this tells us is that it would then seem that it all began day one, month one, at the full moon. And I have always had a hard time with that. I have tried to look at it over the years, and it just wasn't making sense. There was a couple things that I still was glitching on until we see the beginning, which we know is Taurus. We know we were led there by the Spirit, that one confirmation, and we see that when the two great lights were created, the sun and the moon, they were both made light. When the moon was created, it wasn't created in darkness. It's called it the light, which means it was on. The sun, of course, was on, and the moon was on, and it was in Taurus. And only in 2024, I can't accentuate that enough, in Taurus, at the solstice, full moon. It is wild, wild powerful. So, as we continue on to this timing and, and, and assessing this portion that we're talking about of when, when the spirit portion comes to an end and then it's time to focus on the light, can we really understand this portion of time in, in, in all of history? Do we have enough evidence in Scripture to point to us, like we said, here it is in Genesis 1, right? The spirit portion and then light in the darkness. We have it in Genesis, uh, in John chapter 1. We have it in John chapter 8. We have it in, in uh, uh, um, Isaiah chapter 9, referring to Matthew chapter 4. It is absolutely all over the place because Christ said he came to shine his light in the darkness. To what? And he did it for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Those who are in Christ, spirit-filled, the first portion, they are not lost sheep. They are little lambs. The next portion is the lost sheep. And then the Judah portion is the other lost sheep. It's lambs, sheep, and sheep. So once the little lambs are gone, the spirit portion is gone, well, then it's, him again coming to begin his time as light, to shed his light in the darkness. Can we understand this, this portion of time? You see, the, the biggest kicker, the, the biggest thing in all of this has always been, number one, has always been, what year? It has always 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 for 2000 years <clears throat> it has always been what year the disciples thought it was back 2000 years ago is now the time lord and then when the temple was destroyed in about 70 AD they thought now was the time they were expecting the lord now we saw the time even like you know 15 16 1700s they were expecting that it was going to be their time and people kept looking Every single generation has people looking and expecting that the return of the Lord, that this coming of the Lord is going to happen in their lifetime. But just like the revelation that has been happening here for the last seven years that had never been revealed before, they didn't have this to understand what we understand, which is to me a little insight into the time frame we must be living in for the revelation of the open books, the mysteries hidden within them, revealing the understanding of prophecy, had to have been made known before it could start. It's wild to understand that. And what does it mean? Does it mean that we might have another 50 years or 100 years and, and this will just eventually reach more people and everybody will see, seek and search Luke? And then there'll be no more need for, for the lost sheep portion and the lost sheep portion of Matthew? The one of Mark and the one of Matthew? No, it's impossible. Because Scripture tells us there's the spirit portion, the light portion, and the, the flesh portion. It's, it's awesome to understand this. So 
what is the biggest thing? Or one of the biggest things? The year. How can we know to understand the year? Do you not think people in 1967, when Israel was being attacked and there was the 19, the 67 war, and they won it so quickly, do you not think maybe people were thinking back then it was the time? Absolutely they were. So as much as looking to events going on in the world, like what's going on in Israel right now, of course we look to that in the prophetic and say, oh my goodness. This has got to be it. Well, I agree with you. But how can we how can we really understand to know if this is it? How can we really know that it's not just another another event like 1967? They're going to defeat them. It'll be over. Everything will settle down and off we go till I guess another 1967 count to 2037. Do you really think we have 14 or, or 18 more years with a Leviticus 19 count in there? Nobody believes that that watches for prophecy. I don't believe it either because of what we've been given. I don't believe we're going to be sitting here for another 14 years bringing this to the world and, and people receiving us all over the place in, in churches when, when we're in the church of Laodicea. It's the time of falling away, not this, this great revival that's coming. So what we're seeing in the world really is lining up to the season and time. But one of the biggest pieces is, is, is the year. And when we've done this count from Leviticus, as I mentioned earlier, and we understand this count, that, that they came in in 1948, that, they're the, that they had to plant, and that they're not the house of Israel, but that they're the house of Judah, as I said earlier. That the house of Judah is from the fall feast time that then they begin their count. And when you do that count for the four, three years they can't take from the fourth year to the Lord, from the fifth year forward it is theirs. That's their timing of then beginning 70 years. That makes 2023 to 2024 the 70th year done. Over. That's one of the first clues. That's the biggest clue in tracking and understanding the 70 years. But now within the 70 years, <clears throat> you know, here's the thing. Do you know that within the 70 years, having been from, you know, about fall time last year to sometime in the fall this year, do you know, realizing it's the 70th year, we could have just all sat back, you know that? You could have just sat back and just thought, oh, okay. I'll be with the Lord and I'll go do my things. And, you know, it's eventually closer to the time of the fall feast, but maybe we'll start watching it around August. And But we didn't do that. We wanted to keep diligently seeking and searching out the Lord so we would be ready. We weren't given the revelation just for the heck of it. He could have given it to anybody on earth and brought any of the 8 billion people to hear it from whoever he decided to give it to. And he chose us. He chose us. So how do you think we should treat it? With the respect the word of God deserves. There's a reason I keep doing this, guys. Seven years of continuous, continuous, continuous. No breaks. Why? Because I understand what I've been given. And I know most of you, the vast, vast majority of you do as well. And that's why a teaching like this, and this, even though it's a recap in, in a big picture going down to, to the time we're in and then taking it to the end, even though we've known and understood these things, the awesomeness of it all, the, the, the meaning of it all, what it means that we've been given is... I can't even wrap my head around it. It still makes me just like I, I say all the time, like my head explodes. I can't, I can't comprehend why we've been given what we've been given to the full extent. But I now understand over the last couple of years, better than I ever have before, that it's not for 
everybody. This is purposed to prepare a people for his name. That's all I could say. Doesn't mean I think everybody is going to be a worker and serve the Lord. No, I don't believe everybody here will. But do I believe the majority will? I do. I believe others are just being given rewards because they're thirsty and seeking the Lord and have been desiring to understand his word and prophecy and the spirit leads them here and they're rewarded with being able to diligently seek and search and understand what's being revealed. <clears throat> but to the majority, it's a people being prepared. And I don't think we're going to continue to do this for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Not in this context of, of just keep teaching and, and proving out what we already know in the revelation that just continues to reveal what we already know, just with more detail. Because I believe when the Lord comes for the 40 days and that remnant group is prepared, has been chosen, and they know and they're waiting for the Lord when he returns from the wedding, he's going to finish the story for them. He's going to open up the rest of their understanding that they might understand the scriptures as it says only in, you guessed it, Luke chapter 24. The exact portion that represents that group that remains. The same typology as the two on the road to Emmaus, the Moses and the Elijah companies. That's who they represent in the years to come. It's this group being prepared. And what is this timing? So, so if the year... If we can understand this timing within the year, <clears throat> then what about the, the season, right? What about the season, which I, I was certain that we had it all the way back in August. We were looking specifically to that for, for over a year. But we knew also that there was a connection to something called the year's end. And that there were two types to it, two portions of it. And we know from Exodus 34, 22, it says, and thou shalt observe. So there's a place where you're going to do or observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of wheat harvest. That's the pre-trip. And, comma, and, so it's separate, but they're going to be done together. And the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Something we've talked on so many times. One is as a course of a circuit, right? Like an end in a circuit, which would appear to be connected to the sun, but not specifically, but a course of, you know, maybe stars, you know, the things up in, in the in the constellations. And the other one being a lapse of time. So the this is something that we'd been banging our heads on for years. Because knowing that the Feast of Weeks is separate from the Feast of Ingathering, why would these two be getting observed at the year's end? You see, why would they seem to seemingly be observed at the time together? Well, for some reason, that's what Exodus 34, 22 is telling us. Now, if this isn't the year and things come and go, then I'm going to look again to next year, but not nothing until the Feast of Weeks time frame in the understanding of it, till next year. But remember, in a Taurus count, and we'll watch until this time again. But besides that, there, there's no other point in the rest of the year. Doesn't mean we're not watching and praying like we did over the last year. We were looking August, August, August for over a year, and we diligently continued to seek and search out the Lord. Because we know it's not just about his coming. It's about drawing closer to him, being counted worthy, loving him diligently, realizing the, the incredible awesomeness of what we've been given, the honor of it. This It's not to be taken lightly. And so we will continue no matter what. So here we are now in this 70th as understood. And we're trying to understand the word year's end. And then we find out that this year's end, of course, is also connected to Psalms 19, which just like the Gospel of John and Genesis first 21 chapters, we know Psalms has a 14, 15 year count in it as well from Psalms 18 to 33. 
pre and then the 19 and then you get to 33 and it's for the Lord his return and all this stuff dwelling with the people and what did we find out well we see the same thing here uh starting in Psalms 19:4 their line is gone out throughout uh, through all the earth and their words to the end of the world in them he hath set a tabernacle for the sun so is it does it just mean the sun but what did he say their line is gone out throughout all the earth and their words these are the stars to the end of the world in them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun you see it's not telling us it's the sun it's telling us their line in them he set a tabernacle for the sun he's talking about the stars and it says which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man ready to run a race his going forth is from one end of heaven listen to this his going forth is from one end of heaven and his circuit that same word and his circuit unto the ends of it and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof okay that would be okay the the connection to the sun but what are we seeing he is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber relating to the constellations going as the circuit of the sun from one end unto heaven unto the other okay and we know that this is a picture of the lord returning from the seven-day wedding that he had this is a picture of him returning after his wedding his gentile wedding as a strong man ready to run a race this is the white horse rider coming and in the chapters to years that we call it is the picture of the beginning of those 40 days so what do we come to see in this well let's go track it we came to find out about Arcturus. A brother had shared in the forum, and he had shared some things about it, and I went and dug into it as well and found the connections that I saw with Scripture, and we found out some things about Arcturus. We know that, of course, it's the fourth brightest star in the night sky, and it's the brightest star in the Northern Hemisphere, which matters when you understand where heavenly mount zion where the mountain carved without hand is going to be coming from which is connected to the brightest in the north something we've talked about well what else do we know we know that arcturus is a star mentioned in scripture it turns out that it's mentioned twice watch this let's go to job chapter 9 this star arcturus is mentioned with orion and pleiades Orion is a constellation. Pleiades is a star cluster. Arcturus is a star on its own. Why would Arcturus, out of all the stars in the heaven, why Arcturus is mentioned? Why is it mentioned? Okay. We can see that it's used twice. It's connected to the great bear. And look at the root word of it. <clears throat> to hasten, assemble, self to assemble to hasten and to assemble well, that's pretty interesting because the other thing that we see that it's connected to we're going to find out is we're looking for a circuit <coughs> right we are looking for a connection to a year's end well we've got a year's end circuit here that is connected to the son of man but we also have one in exodus that's connected to the 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 pre-trib people in relation to the first fruits of the wheat harvest when they will be observed so you've got the exodus 34 22 one and you've got the psalms 19 one two different portions but both having to be a type of end let's see what comes from this we go to look up arcturus and in arcturus we find out, as we taught, that every Halloween, for a few days before and after, the brilliant star Arcturus, the brightest star in booties, the herdsman, which is the owner of the flock, hello, 
sets uh, uh, sets at the same time and on the same spot on the west horizon, on the northwest horizon, as the summer sun. This star rises at the same time and at the same place on the eastern horizon as the summer sun. So what do you find out that Arcturus is doing? Every year at Halloween, a little bit before and a little bit after, but specifically Halloween, every year Arcturus rises on October 31st. It rises and it sets at the same time as the summer sun and in the same place. What were you looking for? Psalms 19 told us as the circuit of the sun, right? As the circuit of the sun in relation with constellations and, and, and their lines have gone out. And we were looking for where the beginning of the year starts, which this year it perfectly lines up one every 30 years with the in Taurus, the sun and full moon at the summer solstice. Funny how that works, right? We've been looking for an understanding counting with the sun and how it's circuit, where its end comes, and we come to find out that there's an Arcturus that is doing the same thing as the sun, as the summer sun does, but it does it at the time of Halloween every year. And it's in the constellation of the herdsman, which is the owner of the sheep. Funny how that works, right? Well, what about when we were in Exodus 34, 22? What about observing the Feast of Weeks of the First Fruits of the Weed Harvest and the Feast of Ingathering and having this connection to it at the year's end? Well, what is that year's end? To the Jews, it's right here, right? This is the year's end. The harvest is over. Here's on the Jews' calendar. Here's the, the Jews' harvest, right? The, the celebration time. And this is the year's end. This is the very last day. And then what? It's called what? New beginning. New beginning. This is the eighth day. And this is the time of the new beginning. They literally change on Simchat Torah. They go back and read from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and start their Torah readings all over again. Funny how that happens, right? Now, some people might say, well, why would it be here? Why wouldn't you look to start that the seven days begins at Tishri 1, which is the Feast of Tabernacles, and you've got your seven days of tabernacles, and then the Lord coming on the eighth day. Well, where's the connection to it? Where's the connection that brings us to the last day of the Lord coming on the great eighth day of tabernacles? In relation to him having come after the wedding. As the white horse rider. You see what happened? We end up right here with the year's end and the new beginning. You see, when does a new beginning start? After a year's end. Hello. You have to have the last day of the year to have the beginning. See how that works? You have to have the end to have the beginning. That's what we're talking about. If you start right here, and you're going from the, the Feast of Tabernacles, and then the Lord coming on the great eighth day, what evidence do we have? So far, what we've seen in this little bit is pointing us to October 31st, which, by the way, is October 31st and November 1st, okay? From an evening to an evening, if you will, okay? For us, it will be October 31st in the West, and on the other side of the world, it'll be November 1st. Is the connection to the time so far that we just saw in relation to Arcturus which is connected to a year's end and connected to Psalms 19 that gives us this picture of the Lord coming at Halloween. And we have the year's end in relation to uh, Exodus 34, 22 and having the year's end right here 
and the new beginning starting right here, which brings us back to Genesis chapter 1. And what are we looking for? We're looking for the pre-trib group to be taken. You know, we always say give or take like a day on either side, all right? Because the, the movement of the moon and the, the, the timing of the Hebrew calendar compared to what's happening in the movement, we're looking right here. Because we know the Hebrew calendar feasts are wrong, right? So what ends up happening? On the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles, we're from the eighth day, and there's your pre-trib at the new beginning. The new beginning, if we go back to the beginning in Genesis, that portion was what? Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. This is what they read. They go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, on uh, Shemchat Torah. And what's it called? In the beginning, and it was the Spirit of God. This relates to what? The pre-trib group and the wedding taking place. The pre-trib group and the wedding. So here's when they start to read it, and there's our seven-day wedding. Huh. And the Lord comes what? On the eighth day, 31st to the first, depending what side of the world you're on. In the West, where Halloween is observed mostly, there it is. Same time as Arcturus in Booties, the herdsman. That's interesting, right? It's not crazy, but you can. that's part of the story. We can see it. We've, we've come to understand it. And then what do we have? Well, then let's not forget <clears throat> that, as I was saying in the beginning, if we're going back to Genesis chapter 1, and we see that when the Lord made the two great lights, the light of the sun being full, of course, and the light of the moon being full, and he did it in Taurus. So if he did it in Taurus, and the light of the sun and the moon being full, this year, as I said, only happens once every 30 years, and it happened this year, June 21st. Why is this a big deal for us? Well, as we've said before, as I've stated many, many, many times, the Holy Ghost in, in March of 2020, through a confirmation through our sister uh, um, uh, Jodell, confirmed a prayer that I had to the Lord that evening that was that I understood the 50 days and 14 years, that it, was, it had a connection what it meant that I had understood it, that it was related to noon and noon and what it meant and, and all of the connection to it. And, of course, I get that confirmation. It was from the Holy Ghost that I had understood and that the confirmation was right on target. Right on target has been a, has been a, 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 a proclamation here for four and a half years now. And that what has developed from it, what has been revealed over the last four and a half years, has been almost as incredible as the revelation in the Gospels themselves. Because what it revealed and what it led us to, which was Taurus, and that this eye of the bull is called bull's eye, which means right on target, and it is the 14th brightest star in the sky, and 14 in Hebrew represents 50, which is noon. And Taurus is the beginning. And the other eye is called Ayin, which represents 70. How crazy, right? Absolutely wild. 70 and then the 50 and 14 years. It's, it's, it's insanity. And here we were, the ministry of the 14 years and the 50 days, or 50 days, 14 years, and it ends with the 50th Jubilee represented in Taurus right here. And what did we come to find out? That when the spring equinox entered Taurus, the constellation would become covered by the sun in the western sky as spring began. Uh, the sacrifice to the, to the early Hebrews, Taurus was the first constellation in the zodiac. Consequently, it, rep it was represented by the first letter of their alphabet, Aleph, Taurus the beginning you see what why it suddenly starts popping out and what, what what did it say the year began at the spring equinox with taurus with the sun in it 
and we know that the moon would be in it as well. So what ended up happening? Well, of course, we went to as it was in the beginning, in Taurus, when the sun was there and the moon. But this year, we have it at the solstice. It's not at the equinox. You can't be at the equinox anymore because the sun has moved, right? The sun has moved up by two months, but then you have the Jews this year that added the additional month and it just so happened that it lands on the summer solstice, which would, which would have been the equivalent 5,000 years ago to being at the spring equinox. But because of the movement and because of them pushing their second Adar 13th month, it lands for the first time in the next 30 years just as Genesis 1. And it told us that that is what began the year. Okay? That's what began the year. So what did I do? I said, okay. Now, at first I didn't do this. It wasn't until the last, what, month or couple months that I said, wait a second. This would be day one, month one. Not this is day one, month one, and this is day 15. No. It said this began their year. So I said, okay. Well, that would mean then you've got in Taurus, bang, check. You've got the sun because it's at the solstice, which would have been the equivalent of the equinox back then, check. And then it's at the full moon. That's where I was left scratching my head until we went and studied and saw that in Taurus, as I said now a couple times, the greater and lesser were created as light. The moon wasn't in darkness which means it wasn't at a dark moon in creation, which means that it was a full moon. So if we count, and I want people to pay attention to this, if we're counting day one, month one, as it was in the beginning, through the revelation of the Holy Ghost, confirmed through the Hebrew alphabet, confirmed from Scripture in, uh, in Numbers 13, that this, in 2024, is the only year for 30 years that this happens? What happens if we count from this day one, month one, and we apply the same things that we were looking for when we were looking for it on the Hebrew calendar? Where do we get to? Remember, we just saw what Arcturus did. Arcturus just revealed to us, like the sun being Arcturus and happening at that time, it's mentioned in the Bible, and it's the brightest star in the northern hemisphere, which is where the stone carved without hand comes from, and that a week before is also a year's end. So it's shining and moving as it was as the sun at the year's end. And what are we seeing? There was a year's end from Exodus. So we find the year's end as the sun, and then we find the year's end in relation to the to where they have the feast, where the Jews are, are observing their feasts. So that was one, but, you know, that maybe doesn't hold a whole lot of weight on its own. It's not until you start adding the rest, like we're doing from here. And this isn't just guesstimated. This is history. This is scripture. This is in prophecy. This is from the creation. So what do we do? Month one, day one, okay? Which would mean this right here. <clears throat> now, this is where I say, according to the Hebrew calendar, where they have their days, okay? That would mean July 21st was month two, day one, okay? Month two, day one, which would make <clears throat> August 19th, month three, day one. Got it? Full moon. Month three, day one. Remember, the calendar would be off by two months. So, month three, day one. Then what happens? You count out the 15 days, and you get to third month, 
15th day. So if Av on the Hebrew calendar is the fifth month, right? It's the fifth month, but in a, as it was in the beginning from Taurus, it's now what? It's actually the third month. And we get to the third month, 15th day of the third month, in this Taurus count from full moon at summer solstice, we end up on the 30th of Av. Okay? 30th of Av on the Hebrew calendar, third month, 15th day. Okay? We're, we're tracking that? We got it? Well, then what happens? Remember when Jesus was born. We've shown that Jesus, and we've done it, people in, in uh, um, uh, planetariums, all uh, people all over the world have been traveling. We know that Jesus was born what? On the third month, 15th day. Now, isn't it wild that the third month, 15th day on the Hebrew calendar is what it was like in the beginning isn't that kind of crazy in the beginning in the beginning in taurus is connected to what what it was when this year started in the beginning jesus third month on the hebrew calendar 15th day <coughs> third month in taurus as it was in the beginning the way it was when taurus the solstice uh, 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 the equinox at that time. Pretty interesting. Because if you were doing the Hebrew calendar, you would say this was Jesus' birthday. And that's what we were doing since last year to understand and get us to the point of August 12th. But when these times came and went and more stuff got revealed and more came to light, we realized, wait a second, this is the beginning as it was in the beginning to the hebrew calendar this is actually jesus's birth but if we're counting from as it was in the beginning this is the beginning and not his birth this is month one day one so if we go from month one day one and we're looking for month three day 15 then guess what this is the equivalent as it was in the beginning to third month 15th day jesus's birth Remember, not only was is it proven by going through to history and looking at Jesus' birth, but the book of Jubilees even confirms this to us in Isaac. In the third month, in the middle of the month, this is the book of Jubilees, uh, depending which book you have, page 53. And it says, In the days which the Lord had said unto Abraham, on the festival of the first fruits, Isaac was born. Who is Isaac a picture of, guys? We know Isaac is a prophetic picture of Christ. And you're going to want to remember that <coughs> when we bring this towards an end, when we get to the end. Okay? So the equivalent of third month, 15th day, as it was in the beginning with the sun in its place, the sun and the moon, the stars, all in their place, this would be the true 15th day of the third month. Isaac, according to Jubilees, was born 15th day, the third month. We have history in those who have looked it up that Jesus was born the 15th day of the third month. And we know that also in Jubilees, uh, Judah was born on the 15th day of the third month, who is also a picture of Christ because Christ is the line of the tribe of Judah. <coughs> and Isaac was the prophetic picture of Christ. They were both 15th day of the third month. So here we are, 15th day of the third month from a uh, um, June 1st, uh, sorry, June 21st count, okay? You'll understand why this is important. Many of you guys know where I'm going. Now this takes us to what? Now we go to Isaiah chapter 9. <clears throat> We're going to build on the understanding of this importance. Isaiah 9, verse 1. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as it was in her vexation when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. Now, what do we know about this? We've taught on this for a long time now. 
this right here over the last two years this is the prophetic picture of the end of days that we have taught on that we have shared and explained is the first attack that comes upon israel in the northern part it is a prophetic picture zebulun and naphtali of haifa and tel aviv they are not going to be obliterated but there is going to be what the lord calls a light affliction which is going to be substantial like dropped bombs tens of thousands maybe hundreds of thousands of dead because we're now talking about haifa and tel aviv with millions of people there this is the attack as we've revealed for years and confirmed here for two years that the first attack when the pre-trib bride goes at the moment of the pre-trib bride going the very next thing that happens is an attack on haifa and tel aviv in the northern part of israel this is the beginning of what we call the 50 days and then what happens then it says afterward did a more grievous uh, uh um did more gre he did he sorry <laughs> and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond the jordan galilee okay which means there's a more grievous affliction coming after this one in haifa and tel aviv and that one is when syria comes with the philistines with and devours israel with an open mouth and it's in one day this is at the end of the 50 days at the beginning of the red horse rider which begins the 14 years and it is the destruction of jerusalem by syria by what we call the raven the the raven spirit by what we call the uh, uh, um uh, when the sword is given the red of the red horse rider this compassing about that we see in luke's discourse and then bang it starts with nation against nation kingdom against kingdom it begins with this attack by syria and those who are with syria on jerusalem that begins the 14 years but look at what we see before the second which is the great attack comes look at what happens after the light affliction the attack on haifa and tel aviv is going to come right after the the pre-trib happens and then look what does it say what does it say the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them hath the light shined and what do we get for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given it sounds like jesus's birthday doesn't it it sounds like jesus's birthday well here we are showing this is the time of jesus's birthday of the third month 15th day right this is the third month 15th day this is his birthday isn't this what we're looking for then right isn't that what we're looking for he's coming to shine his light in the darkness on the at the time of his birth but you guys know better than that right that's what it sounded like a couple of years ago until it was revealed where it was fulfilled so it was spoken about in the was it was fulfilled in the is and there's a prophetic is to come speaking in it as well and what do we know it's from matthew chapter 4 verse 12 starting in verse 12 now when jesus had heard that john was cast into prison he departed into galilee and leaving nazareth he came and dwelt in capernaum which is upon the sea coast in the borders of zebulun and of Talim, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by isaiah the prophet saying the land of, Ze of zebulun and the land of naphtali uh by the way of the sea beyond the jordan of galilee of the gentiles the people which sat in darkness have seen a great light this was jesus fulfilling the is of the was and we revealed what it means of the is to come and you know guys you guys all remembered if you've been around for a little bit <clears throat> you know why this one was so exciting for us why it was so incredibly exciting because 
though it appeared that Jesus fulfilled this at his birthday, according to what Isaiah said, it should be connected to his birthday. And what we know about Luke chapter 2 and Luke first four chapters being in order, I had been convinced that it was at his birthday until the greater piece of revelation came about a day later. And that was, now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison. That was a huge, a massive aha moment. Because that meant it was about two months later when Jesus fulfilled this. It wasn't actually at his birthday as Isaiah would appear to, to sound it like. But it was about two months later. And how do we know this? Because Jesus, it says, when Jesus had heard that John was now cast into prison. And if you recall, we go into Luke chapter 3. And in Luke chapter 3, we read how the Holy Ghost descended in bodily shape like a dove upon him. And the voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. Okay, This is when John baptized Jesus. And when John baptized Jesus, what do we see? It says, and Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. So when at the time, at about the time of Jesus' birth, is when he was baptized. John wasn't at prison, in prison yet, because he was the one that baptized Jesus. Then what happens? We go into, well, you can go into Luke chapter 4. And we know that Jesus ends up then gathering some people, right? He, he roams around for a little bit first. Then he gathers disciples, right? He goes in, uh, let's not forget, he goes into the wilderness for 40 days. Then he comes out and he gathers disciples. And when he gathers disciples, we go to John chapter 3. And in John chapter 3, we see in verse 22, it says, After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John was baptized, also was baptizing in Anon near to Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison. And then John, a couple of John's disciples say, Hey, uh, John said unto him, Rabbi, you know, beyond the Jordan, the one who, who you said, he, he's over there baptizing. And he goes on to say, you know, the whole story, verse 28, and you yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, right? I am not that light. He came to bear witness of that light. But you see, so where are we now? Remember what I said? I am not that light. John was not that light in, Genesis, in uh, John 1. But he came to bear witness of that light. You see, but that, but that I am sent before him. I am sent to bear witness of that light. He that has the bride is the bridegroom. So when is Christ coming back? Well, he already has the bride. According to this time frame, it's about, it's just right around almost two months later. John isn't yet in prison. It's like six or so weeks later. And John is soon to be in prison because John was imprisoned about right around two months after Jesus was baptized. And here he is telling you the same thing that we started this off with in John chapter one. That the one who was of the spirit as a witness came before him to bear witness of him. That Jesus was that light. So what is this saying? He's saying that Jesus is the light. And he's saying this, Jesus is the light, right before he's being cast into prison. And we're reading, in the same typology of the time frame we're looking at, it says that he that has the bride is the bridegroom. So when we go back, when we go back now, and we see what Isaiah is talking about, 
and we see that it's not at Jesus's birth, but it had to be about two months later to when John was now cast into prison, according to Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus fulfilled this, John was now cast into prison, which was about two months later. So if we go two months from the 30th of Av at the start of September, and we go to the 29th, right? There's no 30th for the end of Elul. There's one month. And then we go to what? The 29th to the 30th of Tishri. And what do we get? Two months. Exactly two months later from Jesus' birth in a beginning Taurus count at the summer solstice this year. In Taurus, sun and moon full, just as it was in the beginning. And two months from Jesus' birth is October 31st on our side to November 1st on the other side of the world. What are the chances? What are the chances that this equaled the equivalent of the Son of Man coming to shine his light in the darkness two months after his birthday when John just finished saying, he's the one, he's the one who has the bride. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. He's saying it at the time. <laughs> Do you understand what's going on here? Not only is the Lord coming two months after when John will have been cast into prison, but he already has the bride, which means the wedding, which we know is seven days before, that when he comes at that point, He's the bridegroom who already has the bride. It equals October 31st to November 1st. How is that possible? How is that possible when we unknowingly to where that equaled had previously discovered that this was day one, month one? from the Lord God's perspective as it was in the beginning. At a full moon, day one, month one. Only to find out a few days later with more study and being re in recalling that, wait a second, what about what we taught? If it's Jesus' birthday and it was two months later and that was such a magnificent, massive milestone piece of revelation, Shouldn't that be still part of the picture? We can't dismiss something that was as awesome as that. And when we added it into the picture from a day one, month one in Taurus on June 21st, it equaled the same date of November uh, of October 31st. What were the chances? I say slim to none. Unless it were true unless we have actually come to understand this. Did we finally get it from the year's end to the year's end? From, from a feast of time being ended in years, uh, uh, in the season to a year's end based on a star's circuit in course. It equals the same date to something that was so powerful that we simply could not forget to include. And in account, when they start over in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, isn't that crazy? So, now, let's look at this, okay? Watch what happens. Remember what we were saying about the, the months. If the months are off, right, by two months, and it's kind of like two and a half, really, right? And this is month one, day one. Then we come to month one, uh, month two, day one, month three, day one, right? We come to the Lord's birthday, 15th, quote unquote, 15th day, third month. And then what happens? 
That would mean Tishri, the month that we're in right now, the Hebrew seven month, is really what? The fifth month. The fifth month. And this would be what? Right here, because it's two and a half months we're talking about. We're talking about the fifth month, day one, right? Day one, month five. If this is day one, month five, then there's day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Whoa, hold on a second. Fifth month on a Taurus beginning count, full moon as day one, month one, brings us to month five, day one, which makes this month five, day nine. If this is month five, day nine, then that would make Cheshvan month six, and it would make Kislev month seven. But what would be day one? The 15th day, right? Now, remember what I said. It could be a day or so off because of the, 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 the months and how they moved and the moon and so forth, all right? So we always give or take a month, I mean a, a day. But this would be the equivalent of what? This would be Feast of Trumpets, month one, day one, right here. Month one, day one, right here, which means the 50 days end right here. Huh. Funny how that works, right? That's exactly like our chart. It's, it's right around here. This is the end of the 50 days. So if this would be the seventh month, day one, then this would be called the Feast of Trumpets, right? So <clears throat> why is this important? How does it equal exactly this in a count that equals Jesus' birthday, still counting the two months, equaling it to Arcturus, equaling it from a Taurus count, full moon, from the beginning of creation, and all of this still equals that? Where do we get this from? Well, you guys will remember this from the beginning. We've been talking about this for six years. The revelation of Zechariah. Zechariah, we have understood for about six and a half years now. The 14 chapters are a typology of the 14 years. Within each chapter is a picture of the years, the events that will take place. And here we are in one we've spoken about dozens of times over the years. Zechariah chapter 7. And in Zechariah chapter 7, it is the timing is the seventh year of seals. That's what it's a picture of. And listen to what it says. Verse 5 and verse 7. Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those 70 years did you at all do it unto me. Okay? Which means they did, they did fast and mourn on the fifth month and seventh month. Now, what are they talking about the fifth and seventh month? They're talking about on the Hebrew calendar, they're talking about the ninth of Av from the attack that happened historically. And the other one is Tishri, which they observe on the third of Tishri, <coughs> but it's from an attack that happened on the Feast of Trumpets. If you guys recall when we taught on this and really got it clarified about well, a few years ago, there's exactly from the ninth of Av to the last day before the attack of trumpets was exactly 50 days. It was the confirmation of our revelation that we understood the 50 days that were above the 14 years. And what was it? It was the ninth day of the fifth month, and it was the first day of the seventh month. And what did it say? It said, when you fasted and mourned <coughs> the fifth and seventh month, even those, everything's past tense, 70 years, did you at all fast unto me, even to me? 
Why would he be saying that, right? So prophetically, we know that from the 1948 count, the Leviticus count, we are now in the end, the tail end of the 70 years. Which means for 70 years, they were fasting and mourning in the fifth and the seventh month from when it was theirs to begin their count. We're in the 70th year, and they had to have what? Fasted and mourned in the fifth and in the seventh month. Well, guess what? October 1st, uh, sorry, October 3rd to the 4th this year, just a week and a half ago, they observed this feast, uh, this fasting on October 5th. This is when they observe it. They don't want to observe it on the Feast of Trum on Trumpets, on their Feast of Trumpets, so they observe it here. And it told us prophetically that they did this for 70 years. We know when their 70 years began. We know that this is the end of their 70 years. But why is the Lord saying, did you at all do it unto me, even unto me? Is it because for those 70 years they weren't properly doing it or they weren't doing it unto him? Well, if we remember what Jubilee said and we remember what Scripture says, it says they do err not knowing the Scriptures. It says in Jubilees that they erred because of the sun and because of the moon. Hello. That they're observing things in the wrong places everywhere. And it says that they did this for 70 years, the fasting in the morning on the fifth and seventh month. And then what happens? Well, we took it back to Zechariah chapter 1 which would be close to the beginning of all of this starting. And what did it say? In Zechariah chapter 1, verse 12, Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, against which you have had indignation these 70 years? These <coughs> 70 years, meaning in the 70th year. He's upset. He, the angel is saying, Lord, when are you going to have mercy? Not on the people, but on your land. Like, like Leviticus 26, I think it is. The Lord says, it's my land that you are sojourners on. You were to take care of it, but they were disobedient on it. And so they were on it and have been on it for themselves after what they were supposed to do when they first come in, like Leviticus says, and then for 70 years. Now it's time for them to be removed. And what did it say in Zechariah 7, like the seventh year of seals in the 14 chapters? It said, those, when you fasted and mourned past tense in the fifth and seventh month, even those 70 years. So if we are in the 70th year and we have understood that we are still in it, and the understanding is because it will be as it was in the beginning, which is why the Holy Ghost revealed and gave that confirmation in that revelation of 50 and having understood being on target, Lord, in my understanding. And the Holy Ghost gave 50 and said to Jodel, right on target. And it meant Taurus. It meant bullseye. And it revealed all of these things from account of Taurus, which brought us all the understanding back to the beginning, for which we didn't yet until recently understand this connection that Taurus with the sun and the moon together created the, was the beginning. And only this year did it equal the solstice, which was the equinox back then. And when we tracked and said, okay, what if we continue this count as that being the beginning. It equals them in their 70 years having observed their ninth of Av and their uh, uh, trumpets, but really the fasting and mourning of the seventh month. They will have now observed and have now observed them for 70 years. Do you understand now there's no option? Do you understand why we don't look and say, well, maybe next year, or maybe the one after? Not if you do account from when they came into the land. It's impossible. Not kind of. It's a literal impossible because it's Leviticus says when you come into the land. They didn't come into the land in 1967. They came into the land in 1948. And when you track it, as I've said, this is the 70th year. And if they've observed the fasting of the morning of the 5th 
and now they've observed the fasting of the morning of the seventh, and it's the 70th year, then we must be near the end of it somewhere. But there was another clue in this, because the fasting in the morning of the fifth and the seventh month was a picture of attack one and 50 days playing out. And when the 50 days were over, attack two, which is the one from Syria. The first one is the representation of the attack from Iran and those with Iran that would bring uh, not absolute destruction, but significant destruction to Haifa and Tel Aviv after the pre-trib has happened, moments after the pre-trib. Haifa and Tel Aviv are attacked and significantly destroyed. 50 days pass. At the end of 50, you've had the seven-day wedding. You had the 40 days of the Son of Man. You have the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And then what did you have historically? You had the attack that we know is the one prophetically playing out again from Syria in Isaiah chapter 9, which is the lion coming from his thicket that's going to destroy Jerusalem the compassing about that he's going to warn about. But it's not happening on the Hebrew calendar because they've erred. And when we count on as it was in the beginning, we end up with a 50-day count that begins from the year's end and new beginning. That brings us the start of the 50 days when they read from Genesis chapter 1, the, the literal people that are the spirit portion and the pre-trib takes place first and the 50 days begin. You have the seven-day wedding from this Taurus count that equals two months later from Jesus' birth. That's the 40 days of the Son of Man as Jonah was, as the 40 days of Noah like Luke 17. And you do the count to the end of his 40 days, somewhere around there. And then there's three more days to the anointing of the Holy Ghost that will take place. And then you have, then you have, like I said, remember, it could be a day or so off on either side. And then you have the beginning, day one of the seventh month. And what will come? The attack on the Feast of Trumpets, the true Feast of Trumpets to the Lord God from a Taurus count as it was in the beginning. I didn't make this up. We've known about this for a long time. In fact, in the beginning when we understood it, I didn't yet realize for two years, at least two or three years, before I had realized that between the ninth of Av and the first of Tishri, from the attack one, to the night before that first attack was 50 days. Yet we had known for a couple, three years already that this above portion was that 50 days, which is the seven day wedding, 40 days of the Son of Man, three days to the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Then they go out from Jerusalem and bang, the attack comes from Syria. And Jerusalem is destroyed, but not completely wiped out. Uh, uh, Jeremiah chapter four tells us not completely destroyed forever because it has to take its rest for seven years. That's what it was telling us in chapter one, right? How long? Because it never, they never allowed it to rest. How long, O oh Lord? Now it must rest for the seven years of seals. All of this came from a count that gives us, again, October 31st, the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man, which was connected, as we showed in the previous ones, to Zephaniah chapter 1, to the teacher, which is connected to the other place, which had that connected connection with booty, with booties, right? Connected to the star. And we see that John is even telling them, the one who has the bridegroom is the bride. Uh, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom, sorry. And then he's cast into prison, and it's about two months later, and there comes Jesus, two months later, in a Taurus count. Craziness. But then it still got better, right? Then there was more. Then we came to find out there was the Isaiah portion. I mean, the, the, uh, the Ezekiel portion. 
where it said about laying a siege and and a pen between and it's like they're defending for a little bit right they're being able to defend and it said that this is going to last for how long <clears throat> well remember what it said ezekiel chapter 4 verse 3 the latter portion this shall be a sign to the house of Israel. Who is the house of Israel? The world, the church, the ones scattered all over, those claiming Christ and those who are in Christ spirit filled. This is a sign to the house of Israel. But you see, this sign to the house of Israel, I mean, it, it might have seen like it was like it was uh, uh, um, 1967. What about the 1967 war? <clears throat> what about other wars that they've had? What makes this one any different? Well, that's what we calculated to see if maybe there was a possibility. Because remember, when the Son of Man comes to begin his 40 days, he's doing it October 31st, right? The 31st of the 1st. This is when he's coming. And it just so happened that this count, that's supposed to be a sign in a prophetic understanding for the end as well. A sign to the house of Israel. What was shall be. And it says that it'll be according to the number of days, which we know lay on their side, and it would be uh, according to the number of years to the days. 390 days shall thou bear the iniquity to the house of Israel. What did we do? We counted to see from the October 7th, 2023 attack by Hezbollah and, and, and the rest of them, this attack on Israel, you see, it wasn't just any old attack, guys. It was the largest massacre since the Holocaust. It was the largest killing of uh, Israelis, of Jews, right? Not the house of Israel, but of Judah, of the Jews, since the Holocaust. And it was the biggest attack, the biggest outbreak in war there since the 1967 war it is significant and the entire world took notice at a time when we're in this 70th year so what did i do i thought okay well let's count 390 days which would be a sign to the house of israel from october 7th and you guys know the story october 7th 2023 add 390 days boom October 31st. October 31st. So this sign to the house of Israel will last until October 31st. But guess what? In the last seven days, when the pre-trib is taken and the wedding is taking place in heaven, the Gentile wedding for seven days, what did we say happens according to Isaiah chapter 9? There's going to be an attack by Iran, like we've been saying for five or six years, Haifa and Tel Aviv will be attacked and destroyed, you know, devastated, not completely destroyed, but devastated, probably hundreds of thousands that will die. Maybe more because there's like 5 million people in, in Tel Aviv, but hopefully not. But it will be a massive devastation. And this is that short war that will break out in Israel that will last about a week. Isn't it interesting that the exact last seven days of the 390 from the beginning of this attack is when the real portion, the, the greatest portion of this devastation comes? And there's only seven days, and it's the exact seven days. The exact seven days we've been showing prophetically revealed from Isaiah, from, I mean, uh, from Zechariah and from Isaiah 9 for years. To the date that it equals in everything I've just been talking about, that this is the end of the 390 right here. This is the end of the 390 right here. And what did it say next? Then, for the house of Judah, he's got to lie 40 days for the house of Judah. When does the Lord deal with 40 days for the house of Judah to warn them that Jerusalem is about to be attacked and destroyed? You guys, you know this is there. This is in John's discourse. I mean, uh, Luke's discourse. This is in Luke chapter 21. It's in Luke 19. Not found in the other gospels either. Nor in the other discourses. 
But we see right in Luke 21, uh, verse, verse 20. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains and let them which be in the midst thereof depart out and let not them that are in the other con in the countries enter there into for these be the days of vengeance that all things will be fulfilled it's the same thing he says for they knew not the time of their visitation not one stone will be left upon another your children and everybody they will not have mercy on any of them this is that time when he is coming to warn them for 40 days and when has all of this revealed that this coming of the Son of Man comes? October 31st to November 1st, depending what side of the world you're on. And when did the 390 end? October 31st. Did I make this fit? Did I, did I make any of this up? Or did it land exactly, exactly, on the date, like everything else that I've been showing you that connects to this time right here. Exactly to the date. And when it lands exactly to the date, you'll remember, you'll recall what it said. Right? What did it say? There's your light affliction. The last seven days of the 390. And when the Lord comes, he's coming to what? Walk in those that walked in darkness have seen a great light. When he's coming for those 40 days at the end of the 390 and the last seven days were that attack of Isaiah 9, when the Lord comes, he's coming to shine his light in the darkness. It's the exact same date. It equals the exact same date. Isn't that crazy? Well, let's continue with the story a little bit more as we start to tie this all together into a pretty little bow. Remember how I said there's 21 out of, out of the 50 chapters of Genesis. There are the first 21 play out in the same typology of the 21 chapters of John. We saw, like we did here, we saw the story of the beginning and the creation and all that with Christ being the beginning and then light and the darkness. There's your pre-trib group. Here's when he comes to begin his 40 days, the light in the darkness. We see the story of, the, of John who, who bore witness of him when he comes as the light. And when John bore witness of him when he came as the light, we see that it was two months after his birth when he already had the bride. <laughs> come on. And then we take it to Genesis and we see that exact same storyline playing out. Here he is, pre-trib, a group chosen from them. And then he comes as light to shine his light in the darkness. Okay. Then what happens? We go to Genesis chapter 7. Look at the storyline we see in Genesis 7. We see this yet seven days and after seven days. Then we see the 40 days of the Son of Man, the typology of the 40 days of the Son of Man beginning. Then we come to Genesis chapter 8. And in Genesis chapter 8, we see the end of the 40 days. So you had seven days, you have uh, the, this picture from, from chapter 7 into chapter 8, like it's beginning, you have this seven-day period, you have 40 days starting, and here we have the end of 40 days, then the raven is sent out. Remember I said a moment ago that when Syria goes out, Syria is a picture of the raven. For those that hadn't seen this before, let me show you what I'm talking about. In Genesis chapter 8, we see that when the raven goes out, the 40 days have come to an end, and that's like the 40 days of the Son of Man. 40 days. That's why in Luke 17, Jesus, it talks about that his days would be the 40 as, Jonah, as Noah's were. So when the 40 days are over, you had seven days, you have 40 days, and then you have three days left of the 50. Son of Man is gone, and that's when the raven, that's when Syria comes and surrounds them. Look, raven, dusky hue comes from Hebrews 6150, which means Arab. It's from the duck dusk the dusky complexion of their skin. That it means the it means Arab. And when we go to Jeremiah chapter 4, 
it says the lion is coming up out of his thicket. He's the one coming to destroy them, and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. The raven is the Arab. The raven, it's the same thing. Like if you go into the storyline in Genesis, when Abraham has his first kid, and he's 86 years old, Ishmael is born. Who is Ishmael? Ishmael is the same picture of Syria. Ishmael is the Arab line, right? Ishmael is the one that brought the attack at the Feast of Trumpets after that 50-day portion from the first attack and brought they, they stayed in the land and they were going to do some things. And then Ishmael comes and Ishmael with his guys kills Gedaliah and that's the one for the fast of the seventh month. It was Ishmael. Not this Ishmael, but Ishmael. And when Ishmael was born, Abraham was 86. And then they get the son of their promise, who is Christ, or a picture of Christ, who was what? Who was, uh, uh, um, of course, Isaiah. But before that, 13 years later, God then makes a covenant with him and his family, Jerem uh, um, Abraham's uh, 99, and, and Ishmael is 13. It's like the seven years of seals, six years of trumpets, and the Lord returns for that final year. And in that 14th year, when Abraham is now 100 years old, having made the covenant in that final year, <coughs> we end up seeing who's born? Isaac. Isaac, the prophetic typology of Christ. What? In the 21st chapter. What did we say? 21 chapters of Genesis to the 21 chapters of the Gospel of John. And so what did we see in Genesis 8? There was from 7 into 8, the 7 days, the 40 days. When the 40 days were over, the raven goes out, compasses Jerusalem, which is the warning that the Son of Man was giving for 40 days. Then there's the anointing of the dove of the Holy Ghost upon the remnant workers that then go out from Jerusalem and bam! True feast of trumpets to the Lord God. The raven attacks and destroys Jerusalem and the Jews flee and they're fleeing for the next seven years from Israel with the exception of a remnant brought back to build the foundation. Okay? Now what happens? Watch what happens here. So we're seeing seven days, 40 days, and then, you know, this 40 days picture of the Son of Man, right? And, and this Son of Man picture of the 40 days, everywhere we've talked about it, he is what? The light coming to shine in the darkness. He is the light in the darkness after the light affliction. He is the light in the darkness. And we know it's two months after his birthday. So now what happens if we go to the Gospel of John? Let's go to John chapter 7. Let's see what the connection is here. First of all, we see it's the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles that was at hand. That's an interesting context because if it's the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles and you go to Leviticus, Leviticus says these are the feasts of the Lord. So why in the New Testament do we see sometimes Passover and Tabernacles being called the Jews' Feast? Why is it the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles and not the Lord's Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. You see? Why did Jesus himself not go up at the beginning of the Feast of Tabernacles if it was the true Feast of Tabernacles? You see? The, he, he had the apostles, right? Those guys, they went up. Well, what were they? Jews. So they went up. It was the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles. I think this is a hint that it wasn't the actual time of the Lord's. But guess what? We knew that everything was wrong. It already tells us that they've erred. Jubilees already told us that they would err in all of their feasts and all of their Sabbaths and all, their, all, their, uh, um, all of their observations. We know that they did. So I think this is a clue that it says the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. And as we read the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand, the Lord ends up going then about the midst of it. And then we see when he is there at the last day. 
in John 7, 37, in the last day, that great day of the feast. Do you guys know what this is? For those that don't know, that last great day of the feast is this one right here. The last great day of the feast. This right here, it's the eighth day. He's talking about the eighth day of the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles. And he says, them that thirst, let them come to me. And then we see there's division among the people. Listen to what he says. <clears throat> Listen to what they're saying about him. Uh, division among the people about who he is. Let's read it. I don't want to go into too much of it. But there's division as to um, as to who he is, right? Of this uh, is the prophet. Others said this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? And so there's all this back and forth, right? And it says, uh, but no, no man did lay hands on him. Um, verse 46, the officers answered. Now remember, this is the eighth day, okay? So we're talking about this period of time of the year's end. Right at this time of the year's end, and then we've got the beginning, okay? The very next day. And it says, so So what would it equal in our two months off calendar? That would mean it's this day right here. The great eighth day. Here he is right here. This is not a picture of him having come to start his 40 days. You're going to see. That's not what it is. What we're going to notice is the conversation around it of what's taking place. And then says, um, never a man spake like this. Uh, the rulers say, look, we don't believe on him. Why would you? Nicodemus saith he that come to Jesus. Da, 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 da. Verse 51. Does our law judge any man before it hear him? And now, and know what he doeth. They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look. For out of Galilee arises no prophet. Well, we know that when the Son of Man is going to be coming, he is coming to shine his light in the darkness. And when he comes to shine his light in the darkness, he is coming as Jonah was. He is coming as Luke 11, when he said he would be as Jonah was, right? That he would come and warn. So he's coming to warn for 40 days. And here they are saying, who is this guy? Where is he going to go? And we find out when you read a little bit earlier that it says what? Where is he going to go? Unto the Gentiles? Where is he going to go? To the Gentiles and do what? Look and see. It says, no, there is no prophet from Galilee. But we know that Jonah was a prophet from Galilee. Jonah was the prophet. And we know Christ is going to be coming as the prophet as Jonah was. And on this date that he's claiming this is right here. And then look what it says. The woman caught in adultery. It titles the very last verse, which is literally the beginning of John chapter 8. But it throws this in right at the very end. And there's been a lot of debates over the centuries as to whether this should have been placed in like this. We can show prophetically the reason why the Spirit led them to lead it like, to place it like this. Just as John, as Genesis 7 into 8, here we are in John 7 going into 8, and what do we see? We have this picture, and every man went to his own house. Do you know what happens at this point? Pre-trip. Bam! Pre-trip. And we get this title, Woman Caught in Adultery. Do you know why? Go back to John chapter, uh, uh, Luke chapter 21. Go back to Luke's discourse in Luke 21. Look at what it said. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Here's your very end of Luke, uh, sorry, of John chapter 7. That very last verse, boom, pre-trip. The woman taking adultery, everybody gone to their own home. And look at what comes next. And in the daytime, he was teaching, as I said in the beginning, and in the daytime, he was teaching in the temple. And at night, he went out in a boat in the mount that is called the Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to him 
in the temple for to hear him. Pre-trib, right at the very end of John chapter 7, right at the very end of John chapter 7, pre-trib, and the woman is now brought before him. Luke chapter 21, verse 36. And then what happens? John 8, verse 1 and 2. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Hello. Do you follow? This is why trying to understand over the years where we would look to John 7 and, and, and we understood John 8, but we couldn't, this correlation to why John 7 had tabernacles wasn't making sense. At some points it did until we realized that it couldn't because the, the story is the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. But now that we understand this timing and this count to the fe first fruits of the feast of weeks of the wheat harvest and when it's to be observed and the connection to Taurus being off by two, mount two months and counting this connection from it, every single part and piece started from right here. And then what do we see? This was Jesus there. And now they all go to their own house and boom, the pre-trip bride is gone. The bride is now what? Luke 21, 36, caught, they're, they're gone, standing before the Son of Man. And here they come early to him in the morning. Haifa and Tel Aviv are attacked. While in, the, while in heaven, a wedding's taking place. The woman brought in adultery, the Gentile bride being brought to him. Then we've got the conversation of the stone's throw. The stone's throw. Nobody could cast the first stone, right? Except the Lord. Only the Lord can cast the first stone. This is the this is the woman, the Gentile bride is in heaven. This is the picture, the prophetic picture right here. And they want to stone her in the events that took place. Jesus talks about being the only one that could cast the first stone because he's the only one without sin. And we have taught and we know that in this week, while the wedding is taking place, that while the attack now, in Haifa and Tel Aviv, in the Middle East war really breaks out. That there's also a stone's throw. And that this stone's throw is Luke 21, 25 through 28. In this stone's throw. And then what comes? Then comes the Son of Man. And when the Son of Man comes, what is he going to be? Well, lo and behold. <coughs> John chapter 8. Look at what comes next in verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Why do you think that Jesus is coming to begin his 40 days as the light that's shining in the darkness? Because it's a prophetic revelation as it was from the beginning of creation. Those in the beginning, part of those who are the Spirit of God, of the sons of God, are taken first. They are the pre-trib. Those who are counted worthy to stand before the Son of Man. Those who were predestined. Those who had the Spirit of God in them from the beginning. And a remnant would remain who have the light in them. Who are the witnesses that will bear witness when the Lord comes as the light who is coming to shine his light in the darkness. And those who are in darkness, which is the sleeping lost church, will not comprehend it. Which is why when he comes to shine his light in the darkness and the darkness will not comprehend it, that's why Luke 17 told us that when he comes at that point, he would be rejected still. Because not a single person in the church understands that the Lord, the Son of Man, is coming for 40 days to shine his light in the darkness and to warn about everything that's about to come. But when he does, and when he warns it, when he comes to shine that light in the darkness, he will do it on the John the Baptist types, on the Elijah company. 
who bear witness of his light will take on his light from them who are the little lambs who are the little stones who will go and serve for him and again they are the ones who will take part having suffered like him will take part in his glory in the resurrection in the final year when they will be resurrected to rule and reign with him during the millennial reign it's replaying all of creation that I explained was 14,000 over the 21,000 big picture or the 14,000, 7,000 of days, 7,000 of 7,000, which is days to the Lord. And that little portion that's above that comes first. In the end of days, it's that little portion first, the above, and then 14 years, <coughs> excuse me, seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. It's going to replay from the was to the is to the is to come all of creation being replayed again in the storyline of the end of days the light is coming to shine his light in the darkness and that darkness comes after the pre-trib when he has his bride when an attack happens in Haifa in Tel Aviv that he will then come to shine that light in the darkness and to warn of everything that's coming and in that warning will be rejected because nobody knew he was coming except a remnant having been prepared it's wild guys it's so wild but it doesn't end there as you guys know right let's take this a little bit further to end this creation portion of the storyline you see i built it from the beginning and and these different portions in the pre and the mid to give us this understanding how all of this is leading us to right here right now where we are from here to here all the way down through the pre-trib the seven days the son of man coming on everything pointing to this date right here when he returns as a son of man for 40 days, they've observed the fasting in the morning of the fifth and seventh month, but it will be on the true timing of the fasting in the morning of the fifth and the seventh month to the Lord God, because that is the 50 days before then the 14 years begin. And what do we see? The 40 days that begin right here after the seven day wedding. This is all connected in John and in Genesis, just as I started it with the creation and showing the different groups of the pre, mid, post, the Luke, Mark, Matthew, from John 1 to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Well, guess what? The pre-story is there, but so is the mid-trib great multitude rapture story, and so is the post-trib return. John chapter 14, Jesus says, what is John chapter 14? Well, in the big picture 21, this would be the seventh year of seals. And what does he say? What do we know is coming? The Lord is coming with paradise, with the mountain carved without hand. And what does he say in John chapter 14? In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. In the chapter that he spoke about him going to do this, it is the equivalent prophetic chapter of his coming to receive them unto himself with paradise. The people that are the mid-trib great multitude rapture that 2 Corinthians chapter 12 told us was going to paradise, which is the place prepared where he went. Come on. What does Genesis 14 tell us? Watch this. Genesis 14 is the very first time that Melchizedek, the king and high priest of the Most High God, is mentioned. It is a prophetic picture everybody knows of Christ Jesus, and here he is being mentioned the first time, and Abraham bringing his ties to him. He is a picture of Christ. And what do we know about the 14th chapter of Genesis as the 14th chapter of John? It is a picture of the seventh year of seals when the Lord is coming, and he's what? He's going to gather the great multitude rapture. And when he comes, he is coming as high priest and king, Melchizedek, to rule and reign from Mount Zion. And what do we know from Psalms 110? Listen to the timing of this. 
Psalms 110, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And the Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Verse 4, the Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Oh, really? What does this have to do with the end of seals in the seventh year of seals? It's when he sends the rod of his strength out of Zion. Want to see what that is? You want to know when he sends the rod of his strength out of Zion? When he's coming at the end of the sixth year to start the seventh year and then gather the great multitude? Watch this. Let me prove it to you. When is the rod of his strength coming? Well, if you want, we can go really crazy and go into the details by seeing what we've taught in the seven churches of the end of days and show how the end of Thyatira is the end of the sixth year when the Lord is coming, what? With the rod of iron as the morning star? But let's show it more accurately or more clearly to show you it's connected to the great multitude going to paradise. Remember, he's, it's when he's going to have his rod, right? Revelation chapter 12, 5. And she brought forth a man child that was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. What was Psalms? What was Psalms 110? When he will, when the Lord shall send the rod of his strength, and thou shalt rule in the midst of thine enemies. Here is his rod when he's going to rule all nations. And what does it say? And her child was caught up. Wait a second. I'm telling you that it's the was caught up when he comes as Melchizedek. It's when he comes with paradise, which is in John 14, which is Melchizedek when he's showing up for the first time in Genesis chapter 14. And both of them relate to the seventh year of seals. Well, if so, and that's paradise, should that not be second Corinthians chapter 12? The second group that is the was caught up that goes to paradise. Funny how that works, right? Isn't that crazy? The was caught up that goes to paradise when he comes to rule all nations with the rod of iron, which is connected to Melchizedek, which is first mentioned in Genesis 14, which is mentioned in John 14 when he is coming for them, when he's ruling with a rod of iron to catch them up to paradise. Do you understand this isn't made up? This is this is everything being connected and showing to you. Pre, mid, and post. Spirit, light, flesh. But then there's there's still one more, isn't there? Isn't there John chapter 21? John chapter 21, a picture of when the Lord is now returned, which we see from the end of like John chapter 20, which is like the end of the 20 years or the end of the 13th year of trumpets. Right? The 13th year of tribulation, seven easy, seven of seals, six of trumpets. That's 20 years. And then you have the 21st year, which would be the Lord here. And we've done a teaching on this. Do you know that we've got a teaching on the 153? You should go look it up if you haven't seen it. It's absolutely awesome. The reason for the 153 fish is all about the resurrection of the just. It's the dead in Christ who have served the Lord, the Smyrna group, that John Porsche, I mean that Luke 24 group that will be resurrected to rule and reign with them. But do you know what else it says? It says it's the third time he's coming to them. Hello. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself unto his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. This is now the third time that he shows himself unto them. Here we are in John chapter 21. It's the third time he now shows himself unto them. Check this out. First Corinthians, or uh, Second Corinthians, there was the first group in Christ. They're going to the like a rapture to the third heaven. Here's the second group, not quite in Christ, but came to them in seals, and they are the was caught up that go to paradise. John 14, Genesis 14, right? And then what does it say? Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you. What did it just say? It just said in John 21, this is the third time Jesus now shows himself to him. In Genesis, in John chapter 21. Well, do you want to see the icing on the cake? You want to see the icing on the cake? What if we go to Genesis chapter 21? I already showed you earlier, remember? 
what do you think it's going to talk about? Boom! The birth of Isaac in chapter 21. And when is it? The 14th year from when Abraham had first Isaac, I mean Ish, uh, Ishmael, and then 13 years to a covenant with the Lord. And when he is 100 years old, 14 years later, hello, can you say 14 years? Can you say 14 days? Can you say 14,000? And that little portion that started it all above? Isaac is what? Isaac has always been the prophetic picture of Christ. And here he is in Genesis tw chapter 21, the prophetic picture of the return of the Lord, feet down on the Mount of Olives, coming the third time, feet down on the Mount of Olives at the 14th year or the 21st year in the entire storyline in John to Genesis, revealing the pre, the mid, the post. Those who are gone first, when they go mid and when they go post, over and over, all throughout the whole storyline. And let me wrap it all up with one place that connects it all in the same context, all together. Watch this. Hebrews 11.5, by faith, Enoch, that's the pre-trib group and a portion that will remain from them. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, I always say God, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's what we do, brothers and sisters. We are praying to be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. But if the Lord wills it that we serve him, we will be ready as well. What comes after the pre-trib? 40 days, the 40 days of Noah. Verse 7, by faith, Noah, being warned of uh, being warned of God of things not yet seen, being warned of God of things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Who are the co-heirs with Christ that are going to serve him for 40 days? Hello. Then what happens? Then we're talking about the end of seals. <clears throat> Remember what happened uh, um, with, uh, with Abraham in the connection to uh, um, when Abraham gave him the tithe in chapter 14? What do we know happens during seals? The foundation will be laid again in Jerusalem, but that's all that's going to be built in the midst of seals tribulation. And what do we read next? By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go to the place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went, uh, and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations. Only the tribulation of seals will the foundation of the temple be built. So he's going to a place where only foundations are laid in this land of promise. Whose builder and maker is God. That's when the temple will re be rebuilt. In the time of trumpets. And then what do we know comes at the very end. Through faith. Also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and delivered a child hello pre 40 days mid post that's the same story as luke in order chapter one two three four brothers and sisters i hope this bless you i hope it strengthens you i hope you can really see and understand what the importance of this timing truly truly is in the significance of this being the 70th year in a Lord God count as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. Seeing that it's John to Genesis laid out, giving us the same picture from chapter 7 into 8 in both. Brothers and sisters, we are here. This is the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles. This is the eighth day. And what happened, whoops, 
And what happened after the eighth day? Right here. And what is the equivalent? If this is day one of the fifth month in the Lord God's calendar, this is day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This becomes the ninth of Av and is everything we were looking at when we were back here. Brothers and sisters, I personally, myself, I believe we are here. I believe this is it. With this type of depth, this type of revelation, seeing that it only happens once for the next 30 years where these things have all perfectly in line or aligned, it does not happen like this. It cannot and will not happen again for 30 years. In the year that we've been tracking for over a year is the 70th year. Brothers and sisters, with everything going on in Israel, never having been like this since 67 war and since World War II, all this stuff going on with AI and everything else around the world, we're here, brothers and sisters. And I hope and pray we are all ready we are all diligently watching, seeking, and searching because the time is at hand. And we will continue our walk. We will continue our diligent seek and searching until that time comes. And I look forward to meeting each and every one of you, your families, those who are in your homes, brothers and sisters. I am excited. I cannot wait. And I know for those who will serve, the Lord will give all strength the lord will give all understanding through him and through the holy ghost as it has never been witnessed on the earth before so brothers and sisters be strengthened hold your heads high and get ready i love you god bless you god bless your families we'll talk to you soon bye for now